Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast, where we explore cutting edge strategies to keep teams human centered, drive innovation, and empower you with the tools and insights needed to help your team excel and thrive in today's rapidly changing world. Your host is Jane Grunevel, a seasoned expert with over 20 years of experience enhancing team dynamics and innovation. This week, we are delighted to welcome Ali Uren, the founder of Kickstart, an innovative company dedicated to redefining traditional methods of enterprise change management. Ali brings her unique insights into helping businesses navigate transitions, growth, or acquisitions. In today's episode, you'll gain insights on, first, generosity and leadership. Ali discusses the power of generosity, detailing how this value transforms teams and fosters a more collaborative and supportive environment. Innovation Capability Review. Learn about Ali's unique approach to conducting an innovation capability review, a strategy that helps organizations assess and enhance their ability to innovate effectively. Finally, the importance of a kindness bank. Ali highlights the role of building a kindness bank within teams, emphasizing how investing in kindness and understanding can significantly improve team interactions and resilience during challenging times. So, teamwork makes the dream work, and we're here to inspire your next collaborative breakthrough. Gather your team or put on your headphones, and let's dive in together. Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast. My name is Dan Grunewald, CEO of the Huddle 3 Group. And today I'm joined from Tasmania in Australia by Ali Uren. Ali uh, is the founder of Kickstart, and uh, she and I have been bouncing around some pretty cool themes uh, here today before the show and, and online through LinkedIn. So I'm excited to dive in. Welcome, Ali. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Thank you for having me. So uh, perhaps for the benefit of our listeners, you can share a little bit more about your story, how you came to be doing all this great work with teams. So it started way, way back in probably 2006. My background originally was in advertising and comms and marketing. And I knew that while that was worthwhile, it was never going to be the, the, um, my calling, so to speak, the mission. Um, I always wanted to work in education and through my own learning, I saw gaps in really allowing uh, organizations and teams, not just at leadership level, to have the skill sets and knowledge required to be able to fight smart in what was really a changing world and continues to change. So it didn't exist uh, in a way that I thought was going to be valuable, so I created it. And uh, so that actually started, I'll give you, you know, just a bit of a process about where it sort of started and you know, where it is yeah. now. It actually started as a very um, sort of out there trial for people, women at risk. Yeah, and it was around long-term unemployed here in Australia in a traditional model of engaging that group and women at risk that wasn't working. So I created a program, a learning and development approach that focused very much on entrepreneurial principle and learning. And we trialled it. It worked its backside off. And then based on that, the company got a reputation for doing great work in a different way. And then it just started through corporate, started to take notice, non-for-profits, you know, government, and from there on, it just started to evolve. So it really, at its core, was about how do we create a different learning experience, go into areas where people don't get to explore and allow people to own that rather than bringing experts in all the time to give the answers. And so that was always the premise, and it still is. Um, my background is, yeah, about the learning development, being out in the real world, being in the trenches, experimenting as part of that. And um, as I said just before we started, it's taken me to you know, work with over 200 purpose-led brands and 2,000 people um, across all levels and in all roles and teams and locations and, and so forth. So, yeah, I'm excited to continue to evolve it. Um, and, yeah. Uh, take it, you know, take it further afield, but, yeah, make sure that it's malleable and give people back, like I said, democratise um, ownership and learning um, and, and move beyond just leadership. So, that's uh, where it's been since, what is that world? How long is it? We're getting on. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I don't stay uh, idle. And uh, and so for me, I'm excited. I'm, like I said, all the time I'm having these things that will drop in. I'm like, yeah, that can respond to that gap or that threat or that challenge. And, yeah, for me, ultimately at the core of it, uh, it was to create not just looking at strengths where we tend to sit, but turning the, the you know, flipping the, the script on how we look at gaps, threats, and risk, uh, and being able to give people a different perspective around that. And that's probably one of the superpowers um, of this approach around that collective. 
Incredible. Big day. Um, that sort yeah. of sets it apart from a normal uh, approach to people development. Yeah. And so you're, I saw it on your LinkedIn profile. Yeah. You talk about empowering teams to turn challenge into Absolutely. opportunity, but mm. you're talking about two types of challenge from what I'm hearing there, Ali. It's, it's the challenge of the individual. So you mentioned at-risk women or, or people who are lower down in the org that aren't being given the opportunities to grow. But then it's also the organizational team level challenges. So Correct. you're kind of bringing them both together. Absolutely. So you'll see that it deals at both project level, but it also deals with how mm -hmm. we role delivery, right? And how people are connecting to one another, but how the person at role level, at that individual level is connecting to the broader organizational objectives. And we know yeah. the mission, we know that's a real issue at the moment. We know that people are disconnected. Yeah. Look at the data. You can go on. Yeah, I can send you lots of links. You would have read them. Mm. But we do have a disconnect between people's purpose, back to that mm. org, and, and people connecting to one another. It's very, very disconnected and disjointed. So you're right. Getting to areas at one time organically through that approach uh, is critical. Yeah, no, that's that's fascinating. And having started with women at risk, where did you start there? Were you finding women in the community to help them engage in their in their careers or were you going into organizations where they already had a group of... They already had them. Uh, they already had the women. They did. They did, but yeah. they knew what the, the traditional model of career development wasn't going to work, right? And it wasn't working. Right. I mean, these women came from complex backgrounds, right? Like yeah. they had a number of different uh, risks and challenges and threats. So absolutely. So it was through the, the federal government, you know, through um, their employment provider. And yeah. yeah, like I said, we had a provider that just took the challenge and, you know, obviously had a lot of people that come to them to say, oh, I can do this and I can do that. And they said, look, let's, let's, let's give it a go. Let's see where it goes, you know. So uh, it was awesome because that, you know, that piece of work is not dissimilar to what you see now. You get one person mm -hmm. who's got that knowledge, that skill, and that mindset. They start to take it back out into their community. Yes. So they share it with their family. They share it with their friends. And that that's, you know, one of the, the main impacts that I've seen through that work is that it has that ripple effect. It's more than just the yeah. people that you're seeing in front of you. And that's no different with an organisation. It's about yeah. positively changing that story and that narrative. So, yeah, that, as I said, I, I found, you know, and then it went into, you know, creating new models for homelessness back on the mainland here. So bringing yep. career and entrepreneurial thinking to respond to homelessness. So it worked yep. there as well too, right? So it's changing the narrative about who gets what, who deserves to have mm. what, you know, who should get access to this? You know, why should we invest in that? And why should we give certain people access to this knowledge, you know, on assumptions that are wrong sometimes that they won't be able to. And that's no this is brilliant. You know, that's yeah. a, that's no different. You know, like there's so much done and down, you know. And Dane, I'll never forget this. I've worked with lots of people. There was a woman in one of my programs and probably one of the most disadvantaged locations in Australia mm -hmm. who said to me, until I came here and worked with you, no one, no one ever asked me my opinion. Mm -hmm. No one asked people to think. Yeah, and that doesn't matter whether or not you're working with homelessness or people that have been incarcerated. I mean, I have, you know, I've done that too. CEOs, I've done, you know, general managers, entrepreneurs yeah. at uni, been there, done that. It doesn't matter. People want to feel heard. And so for yes. me, it is about taking those um, entrepreneurial, critical, creative thinking in the places where you don't think it's going to have an impact. I love that. I love that. I love proving people wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's in the fringes. There was a brilliant post uh, earlier in the year or late last year, and it was the iceberg of in ignorance. Yeah. And it basically said leaders see this much, but the rest of the organization sees the remaining like 94% of what's going on. Correct. And yet we we continue to make these decisions and hoard the the learning and development resources and the offsites and the strategy right up here where yeah, they don't have true. that access. True. To our detriment. And then we wonder why yeah. people leave. Or we have no talent. And then yep. we're running around, yeah, around the successful piece because we haven't built it. Not being smart, yep. but you have to build it, right? Like if you haven't built it, when the time comes, where are you drawing from? You don't have much to draw from, do you? No, you don't. And you used some interesting language there in your intro. You said you help the whole organization fight smart. Yeah. Like fight's an interesting choice of words. Tell yeah. me more about that. 
Yeah, so that sort of first came up when I was doing the um, transitional piece for Coca-Cola. So I'll put it into some context around that. So Coca-Cola was closing its operation after 50 years in Adelaide, um, where I used to live. And so they, you know, if you looked at manufacturing in that state, it was on the decline. You know, we'd had a lot of organisations that have been around for a long time, Mitsubishi, GMH Holden, um, that were closing operations, right? They used a, a career model that was quite traditional, probably quite outdated. You know, the normal stuff that you expect to get when you've, you've been let go or, you know, you've been made redundant and so forth. So for me, it was about creating a model of engagement and learning that allowed the people to own it. So they couldn't take out the fact that they were going to have, you know, the fact that the factory was closing was going to happen. But what we could do was give them ownership over how they engaged in Kickstart, what they learned when they learned it, how they wanted to use it, how they wanted to play with it and trial it. And so because they were facing, you know, such a lack of opportunity to in that state, they had to go and create opportunities and be smart, find smart at mm-hmm. another level to find opportunities in industries where they hadn't had direct experience, right? You know, create networks where they never had to do that in a way that actually got cut through. So they couldn't do normal. They couldn't just do mainstream. You know, they had to learn, absolutely, how to learn how to fight smart in a market that was changing, you know, just, just exactly like business, like business, you know, um, how yeah. to, to create a brand and identity. Yeah. So mm-hmm. understanding what that meant for them. So all the aspects that you would need to do to be able to not just launch business, but thrive, was taken to these people. And it started with leadership, right? So the production yeah. team wasn't going to get it. This is why I say around the point around spreading the love, right? Production yeah. team was never in the mix. So leadership was in the mix, right? We started there and then they're getting wins and people are getting employment and then they're leaving and they're like, oh, there's something in it. We need to offer it. We need to offer it across the whole mm. organisation. And so we did. And so there was no dumbing down. There was no, oh, take this out or oh, they won't be able to understand it. It was like, no, no, this will be personalised to the individual, but the principles and the core theories and approaches are the same because we know they work and no yeah. one's going to miss out on that just because they hold a different title to senior leadership. Yeah, and that you're so right on the dummy it down piece. There was a um, – and sometimes it's perhaps a little bit more malicious than that. It's it's like protection, protectionism at the top. There was a great article that The Atlantic ran over here a number of years ago. It was called the 9.9% and the premise was the 0.1% of – the population are crazy rich, like Bezos, Gates, those guys. They're they're in their own stratosphere. Then you've got the next nine point nine percent, and that's a lot of these people who are often in leadership roles, well networked in communities, lawyers, doctors, executives, and they all look after each other and they they mm-hmm. protect their knowledge and they create the professions that make it hard to get into. And you know, there's there's a lot of protectionism, right? And then you've got the other 90% of the Earth's population who are doing great work, who are very talented, passionate, capable people, but but they're being told it's really hard to start a business or you can't do legal work without a legal degree and all of these other things. So uh, I, I like the way that, that you're democratizing and just driving down all of this good thinking right through, right through the org, right through the community. Absolutely. That's where we make the change. That's where you get the impact, yeah. right? And we need leaders at the top there that are comfortable in their own identity to do that yeah. too, right? That are generous. Yes. You know, if we need anything in teams, generosity is going to be the thing that can save us, right? And for me, yeah. it is about, you know, we hear a lot about, oh, people don't want to, you know, share or develop a lot of people because, you know, that that rubbish around, oh, what if, you know, I don't want to share it because I might take my role and whatever. That that has to go. It's 1990, yeah. you know, 1991, whatever, right? That's yeah. our day thinking. You know, yeah. give it away. Because like I say, it's not about, you know, if you've only got one trick up your sleeve, you're in all sorts of trouble anyway, right? <laughs> if you've right. Only got... Correct. <laughs> yeah. If you've got one idea, right. right, you're done for anyway, right? So for me, yeah. I'm very generous. You'll see that on my LinkedIn work, right? I will generously share, you know, IP, things I've developed. Um, for me, yeah. there's so much more to come. I'm not stuck for quality content that has been tried and tested. So that is a, yeah. that is that is my one of my values is generosity. So share it, right? I, if I can't be generous with what's in my head, I wouldn't have the business right that I had, and I wouldn't have to do yeah. the work that I have, you know, that I do too, right? So 
those cultural shifts are really critical. Yeah. And I, I think it's fantastic the way you're shining a light on this value of generosity, this mm. action of generosity, because we all see all the posts around servant leadership and everything else. And servant leadership can be great, but it can still be very paternalistic and, and um, condescending, to be, to be really honest. Yeah. Where actually generous leadership is something very different. It's it's inclusive. It's inviting people in. It's sharing, and it's not trying to make decisions for people or protect people from stuff. It's like, hey, let's go out there. Let's go do it. Well, the part of that's a really great point you make, Dave. A part of the work that I do in the approach of design, you actually have to do something with it. Like I know that sounds so obvious, right? But there is a piece of trial, a strong piece of trial and experimentation within this collective approach to learning and development. So you can't actually sit on it. You have to do something with it. And you have a time frame yeah. to do it in, right? So hmm. that is right. So we have everything's time frame, just like the real world. You know, I couldn't put this off today, Dane, nor would I want to. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but this was coming. Yeah. So you need to get your head in the right space, reconnect on some things. So for me, that piece around being able to trial, experiment, do been critical right and it's absolutely there is no point learning something if you can't play with it in real time so we play yeah. with it right so we have those opportunities they choose you know working in consultation with me we co-create those opportunities but they own it you know they own yeah. where they're going to go how they're going to use it right so i facilitate i'm the facilitator of ideas as well as knowledge and intel but the facilitator of ideas is a concept that i've developed which I really see, which is actually striking a chord. I will write content, lots of, like whole articles. And you know what people yep. are picking out all the time? Leadership and management being a facilitator of ideas moving. Hmm. It's really, it struck a chord with people. It keeps happening. People will pick that out yeah. out of all the content and out of all the messaging. Um, hmm. I find that really, really interesting. But yeah, no, absolutely. And then we come back, right? So out in the world, out they go, they play with it. Then we come back. Just like you do in a business, we debrief. So we pull it apart. We look at it with a critical eye. How did it make you feel? How did it work? What didn't work? Take me through it. What did you learn? Where are the lessons yeah. in that? So how are you going to do, you know, how would you design that differently next time to get a different outcome? So again, yeah. just like we do, and we layer it. So it's like a, you know, it's a, um, you know, you're starting here and you've got to get there, right? So obviously it becomes more complex on top, you know, in time. But to get that buying. And that early momentum, right? So people see it because you can talk all you like, but until you've got evidence that, hey, you're not actually yeah. useless, you've got talent. And here's the evidence. Yes. You must get that early. You know, if you leave it in that continuous learning piece, it's hard to get people. So you have to obviously be able to build that trust early, but then get some of that experimentation in, find the confidence, the knowledge, the skill set, you know, the mindset, that experiential bank that you can pull from. And then we go to the next stage. Yeah. So I'm hearing I'm hearing two really interesting things. There's lots of technologies out there that have democratized access to learning, whether it's mm. YouTube, TikTok, LinkedIn yeah. learning, you name yeah. it, right? But you're not just sharing the learning, you're sharing the opportunities to put it into practice, Correct. to debrief. So that's that's going beyond learning into um programming or that there's, there's something more to it, right? Yeah, there is. There is. Because I think, you know, if you're just acquiring the knowledge, right, there's just, yeah. it can just easily not go anywhere, right? And that can be for a whole lot of reasons. That can be within the person, right? Because of what's yeah. happening with them and how they think and how much they value it too, right? But it can also mm -hmm. be because of the environmental uh, conditions that, you, you know, that, that are present within the organization as well too, right? So yeah. for me, it's been about designing, like you said, the whole experience. And then yep. allow people to actually choose their own adventure in a way around how they engage with that learning and being responsible and owning the outcomes around that. And that's like really critical, yeah. Because we don't do we don't do that, right? When was the last time people had an opportunity to look at how that learning is integrated back into their role? We just get, you know, normally roles are done once every God knows how long. They go on a drawer on a file on the computer, they never <laughs> see the light of day again. Where yeah. this learning, and I've written about it recently, Dane, this learning and this approach allows people to integrate it back into their role. So they're constantly assessing, yeah, the role. How it yeah. links back to the mission and the, the purpose of the organisation. And we know there's this connect there. So when we start to do this, we start to address that risk. And then 
we have them assessing, working with their leadership team around how relevant and meaningful their role is as well too. So when I design mm. my work, it is never for one outcome, never. It's being smart and saying how many areas can we hit with one approach. And that's the beauty of yes. it too, right, um, where we don't tend to do that. We tend to just think, oh, well, I've got to learn something. Okay, but hang on. How else can we leverage that learning across these other areas to be able to get more impact in other parts yep. of the organisation? So you see where I'm at here. It's not just me and you. If we're learning, I'm thinking about the other picture around. It's, got the whole, it's, it's teams and teams of teams. It's hitting everything. Correct, okay. correct. And then yeah. it's connecting. How do we change? How do we rewire the relationships between yeah. those parties as well too? So that's also a consideration yeah. within this approach. I, I I find that fascinating. I had um, a former podcast guest, Andre Martin, come in to the office this week and we were doing some workshopping, which was super fun. Um, and he's he's got this really cool way of saying, well, isn't it time that we start interviewing the job rather than interviewing the candidate? And and, and there's something in that, that 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 you're touching on that is there as well, which is if you take a a fluid, dynamic, kind of um, integrated approach to role design and teamwork and ways of working, then you can identify best practices that are emerging and then you can scale best practices through teams in a far more human way than through the traditional, right. you know, continuous process improvement team or whatever it might be that was responsible for that. You made a good point too, you know, we, we need people to own it. They know, you yeah. made a good point right at the beginning. People know their role. They know what they're doing better. We hope they do yeah. day to day. But I would if I'm sitting somewhere else in the, in the organisation. So undertaking yeah. this process really also very early on reshapes how those discussions are had around roles. That is yeah. part of this work. This is an absolute concerted part. If people come onto this, this is what we're going to be looking at too, right? So... That's yeah. the beauty. It looks at it as a connected ecosystem. It's never looked in isolation. And I think that's where it's gone wrong in the past, Dane. We look at learning, like we said, merely the transformation or tra transmission of information between parties. Yeah. Rather than all the other elements that are going to impact that. Absolutely. And in fact, um, I was at a conference in May, the Atlassian conference, and yeah. they had uh, Do Dominic Price was talking about yeah. this modern work manifesto. He had this really cool slide that said, you've got acquisition of information, mm -hmm. which is very abundant now because of the internet and everything else. And then you've got application of that information. And he was like, the bigger the gap is, the greater the dysfunction in teams. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is you're bringing the application and, and the information sort of dissemination much closer together and, and you're removing dysfunction in teams. Correct. Yeah. And, and ownership, yeah, ownership clearly sits. Ownership sits at the centre, right? Because, you know, it I've really had people does. that don't want to work with me. Nothing against me. It's their circumstances, right? So I don't yeah. get offended by that, okay? Where people go, what, are you offended? No, 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 because I know the history, right? So I'm there to work with them to create difference. And there's one yeah. thing I say to people, that when you're starting this process, that when you say it, you can see that there is like a, a visible um, relief in them. And that one thing that I say very early on when we meet is that you'll, you will determine where we go and how you use this. But here's the thing. We will be creating a different outcome. We have to do something, right? We can't stay here, but how we get to yeah. a different place that is in your control and you will influence what that looks like. I'm not here to dictate that to you. And yeah. that is like the biggest connector and the breaking of ice because, once again, people are already quick about it, Dane. People have been told you need to do that. Don't do this. It goes back to that point again of not actually yeah. creating an environment where people can think, have an opinion and share it, right, and put it out there in a way that feels safe and creative too. Let's dive into that because you've mentioned a couple of times this entrepreneurial system or method, and, and now you've just touched on safe and creative. Let's find ways to do it that's safe and creative. We're not tearing down someone's baby or, or breaking things just in a live fire environment. You, it sounds like you're creating a, a construct to do this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So tell me, what, are you, what, would you, what, 
tell me one aspect because there's a lot to that that we could unpack. So, so, so when you get in um, with the team, let's say you're working with an intact team in an organization mm -hmm. that, that's trying to really give ownership back to the team and see where they want to take mm. the business, improve the processes, whatever it might be, improve the customer experience. Um, what is the starting point when you facilitate? Is it, let's go and do some ideation or do the identity values work yeah. or, or like, how does it become entrepreneurial in that setting? Yeah. So there's a first, there's a piece of work we do really early on before we get excited and, and plan better fuel, and that's an innovation capability review. Um, that I actually mm. designed after I, I did that study tour uh, mm. to New York Union 2019. And that is really looking at the organization and team's capability to be able to innovate and be transformative, you know, transformative too, right, against the, the mission of the organization. So it's like a risk yeah. assessment, but on creative steroids. Mm. And so we look at the top, um, the team works with me to identify. So once again, we start to connect it back into the goals. So we identify the top three areas that the organizational team needs to build on, depending on what project is done. And then we undertake this piece of work, which the team, which I will facilitate, but the team owns, and we start to end-to-end -end undertake an assessment on the team's ability from a learning and development you know, perspective or a relationship perspective to deliver on what that is. And from there, we start to identify threats, gaps, risks, um, anything that's going to get in the way of that team's ability to actually deliver on those outcomes, that is the first piece of work. And that is like a roadmap yeah. that we actually mm. start to build from. We don't do any other work. We don't come in because you would know that. People think there's certain problems or challenges, but well, how do we know, right? So allowing the teams to connect in, in that way does a number of different things. Um, it allows us not to get fearful of talking about the things that we tend not to want to talk about, being the gaps, yeah. yeah, the threats and the risk. So we create a place where we can just normalize it, destigmatize it. That's really, really important. And then we yeah. start to through the, you know, because you've got to get comfortable talking about it. You know, you've got to be able to get to say, I actually don't have this skill or knowledge or this experience. Then if I don't get it, I really think it is going to, compromise our ability, not only as a team or as an organisation to deliver on X, right? So, you know, being able yeah. to have those conversations just makes people, you know, be able to breathe and have mature adult conversations around it, bringing it out into the light. And then once we know that, then they decide with my, um, you know, obviously insights and facilitation, but they then determine, okay, what are the top three areas then that we're needing to work on? No more than that. I yeah. always find there's a tipping point and it's three, right? Think about how many strategic plans or learning and development plans never actually happen because there's there's two yeah. women on there, right? It becomes overwhelming. So they have to work uh, and agree and, and you know, do that critical thinking around, well, what actually do we start with here in this innovation capability review? Because most organisations don't even have a plan to really be able yeah. to deliver on that, right? I think when I think the stats were given at NYU, right? 50% or something. I think that's being generous. I think if you went into more, you know, most organizations, so. you wouldn't find much at all. So that is where I always start this work. That is always where I start. That's powerful. And yeah. um, I like the way you frame the normalizing and getting comfortable with talking about the change in what we don't know. Uh, I, I was sick last week, so I started watching Ted Lasso for the first time. I've never seen, ever seen it. Everyone's raving about it and I'm sick and I'm going crazy because I don't like mm. to not be doing stuff. Yeah. So I put it on and there's this great scene where the four managers are about to go out to this cup semifinal and, um, and they all start confessing to each other the things they don't know and the things that they're not doing that they should be doing. Like one of them's like, hey, I never read the talent scouting reports because I find them intolerably boring yeah. right and it's just such a refreshing moment that the team's talking about what they don't know or what they don't like and you're like man if every team spoke like this we would have people that were far more engaged in what needs to happen and not holding these barriers and guards up all of the time so it's challenging respectfully challenging that facade right and the role that we think yeah. we need to hold and play within the actual team as well so, yeah. you know, we set it up. I think before we get there, there's been a lot of work done on, you know, there's a lot of talk about trust in organisations, but really understanding the motive and intent. So we spend quite a bit of time getting to understand one another. And you can't create trust if, if you're not clear on motive and intent. 
and then provide that evidence, yeah. you know. So I'm, I work very hard as well. You know, I deliver. I make myself accountable. So that's the mm. other thing. It's a very fair relationship. There's much that yes. I have to do throughout this project and I make myself uh, accountable and I put it in writing too, right? So everything's put in writing. So everyone's got a record. Yeah. Everyone owns that record. So people will say, oh, so you, you'll deliver on that by then, will you? So they give me account. I'm like, yeah, I will. And, I'll, and I do. Yeah. Right? And if we can't, then we, we converse with one another, right? But it's a very fair relationship. It's not me coming in as an outsider, as I said, the expert, uh, holding all the, the cards and the power at all. So uh, every player wins a prize, so to speak, when you come into this experience that uh, you, you can't check out. And I think that's that's the other thing. People know that you're good on the word. And that can only yeah. be done through Edward's name of delivery. Yeah. You've got to do something. You've got to deliver that. You know, and once again, without time frames, uh, you're not going to get it. It's not going to happen. I, I think that's super important. I'm working with my coach right now and he's all about, I'd prefer that you honor your word. And if you say you're going to do these five things in a week, you do them. If you can't do the five things in a week, just say you'll do one thing in a week. Let, sure. Let's build on, on that integrity and word and trust and reliability in teams. So I will always say to someone, Dane, just off the back of that, if I can, it won't matter who it is that yeah. I'm working with. It doesn't matter where they are in the world, role, you know, doesn't matter. I'll always say to them, hey, before we part ways, looking at what we've been able to cover off, how much, what do you think you're going to be able to hit this week, right? Like, is that a fair and reasonable yeah. expectation? Because I am going to, we are going to follow it up. So if you think there's something in your life or in business at the moment that's going to impact your ability to deliver on it, speak up now. Yeah. And they're like, yeah. powerful. Yeah. Once again, they own it. I'm not putting words in it. You have to own it, right? And it's, it is yeah. about that team. It is about that we will impact one another. If we don't deliver, then we will impact each other's ability to deliver on what we agreed we were going to do. Is there a size of team, Ali, that works? Better than others? Like, is it four to five people, seven people? Can you go into yeah. double digits? No, look, I, I think this is, and I'll be honest with you, I think it's quite an intimate experience. So I think you would mm -hmm. probably be looking at probably, yeah, probably seven, eight would probably be where, yeah. where it would sit, I think, to be able to have, because as I said, it's not a, a quick and dirty approach. So to be able to manage it properly, um, that is yeah. really where it would need to sit and have those discussions and um, be able to do the work that has to happen. So that is where... But it normal. doesn't have to be a peer team. You could take a team diagonally Correct. across Correct. an organisation. And it can be across yeah. functions too, right? Yeah. And that's important. So for me, it's not just within the team. It can be across, which it has to be a lot of the time because there's yeah. other roles that need to be in that discussion. And then also too, it's across functions a lot of the time too. Yeah. Because there's disconnect there, right? And those relationships have to be rewired as well too. So yeah, no, it's, it is very flexible. It will move in a number of different directions. And... In some of your larger engagements, will you run multiple teams concurrently or do you tend to sort of go in series and kind of one follows another? I have run how, concurrent. How it that? depends. Some organizations will say, let's just work with one and see where the lessons and the learnings are out of that and we'll treat it, you know, yeah. sort of more open as a pilot, even though you've been delivering it for X amount of years. Um, and others will run it at the same time. So that's right. Yeah. So, for example, it will be across different levels of the organization. Another right. That's neat. At the same time, which is good too, right? Because there'll be different experiences that come out of it, yep. which you can actually share with leadership as well too. And, you know, once again, it also is number, you know, people across different parts of the organisation having similar experiences as well too. So uh, yeah. there's something in that as well. And, uh, of course, people talk, right? So they talk about what is happening. And so there's different – that's quite powerful too, Dan, that you mentioned that because that then – brings different conversation into the workplace. Positive conversation, right? Yes. And different influences at different levels, shaping that that story as well too. And I found that was particularly important um, with, with Coca-Cola. You know, the people that held the power were not the ones that you always thought. Yes. Yeah, we <laughs> hear that a lot. It's that, that organizational sort of network and analysis, like who really has the influence or the knowledge in yeah. these teams and organizations. Yeah. That's very cool. So in an ideal world, this type of approach can help if you're trying to overcome a, a process issue or an engagement retention issue. It can help. I know you, we were saying before the show with 
knowledge transfer, particularly if you've got aging out workforce, you can really start to help bring, you know, earlier career folks or other functions into the magic of what people have been just doing without necessarily documenting or sharing or even affirming. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So many people will say to me, we're working together. Gee, I can think about it. Like it's, I've got the words. I do it every day. But to try and yeah. formulate it is hard. Right. So yeah, absolutely. And look, ABC here in Australia just did an article recently. We've got four different generations in mm-hmm. the same workplace now for the first time ever. And they did a great article. Um, the US would probably be no different. The UK probably would be no different. So for the yeah. first time to your point, great point, four different generations all with different learning and talent and skills and, and experiences, right? Like we have to be able to have a process and a system to transfer that expertise and to be able to manage it. And that knowledge transfer, that expertise transfer is something that we've seen in this because people know if you're going to be part of this, you can't sit on it. You can't store it away like the squirrel with nuts, you know, for winter. Yeah. It comes back to that generosity part and it's just an organic, normal part of the model and the part of the approach that people buy into once again. So then we de-risk the risk that when that person leaves, you're not going to run around like a, a crazy person trying to be able to get them to write it down or quickly capture you know, how many years of experience that they've had because you've actually caught it along the way. Yes. So it exists as an asset, as a yep. human people asset. And that's not something that many businesses have done. I know there's a few exceptions to the rule that are very well documented on their procedures. and But a lot of companies that have documented procedures, kind of the file still sits on the shelf and is dusty and they haven't updated them as technology and people change. And there's huge workarounds in every team. But it, And that comes down to even sharing and reworking how we take traditional meetings and putting them into idea sessions. Yes. And Tell me more about idea sessions. Yeah. So that's how I've always formulate them. And when people work with me, that's the that's the approach we work on. And so they're like post-mortems, really, but they're creative. Um, and so that's when the team is coming together, not to say, oh, yeah, I've got this action and now I'll deliver on it. You know, make yourself basically justify your existence. These idea sessions is everyone participates in them and they are really yeah. around um you know, what's happened in them. What went, okay, I've actually got them. I think I've shared them on LinkedIn, but I'll, I'll do that, Dane, if I haven't. But uh, what have you done in the last week that you're most proud of and excited about? Uh, what went to, to plan and why? What hasn't gone to plan? And why? What do you think that was, right? Yeah. So people also share, not just the good bits, right? Because we do have a bit of a disease in organisations um, which is called uh, success bias, and you've probably heard of it, right? Mm-hmm. Success bias is, is a killer of development, so let's not go there. So what didn't work and why? Then we'll ask them, so what 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 would you do different around that? And then the next part is where's the lessons that you would share that can benefit us as a team and as an organisation? Yeah. How can we use this? So it makes them think to just once again, you can't sit on it, you've got to share it. How do we take that? What can we do with that? And so there's a couple of things around that. You're gathering proper intel that the business can leverage as well. You know, yeah. as well as the yeah. individual and team, but you're also reframing how we've seen mistakes and when things don't go to plan. So this is how, yes. yeah, if we think about it, right? So if we didn't have the opportunity to debrief on that, I would sit there, depending on who I am and how I think, ruminating over what didn't go well. Yes. But when you come to the idea sessions, you have a, you know, a place where we all add to it and there's some solutions as well. Sometimes, you know, people will help each other out with that. But sometimes you need people to actually sit in it. And I mean that in a good way, right? So I don't come and save you if you don't have the answer right away. That's not helpful. That's not helpful. Yeah. So I would say, no, it's important. Have a think about it. How about you take a day, have a think, let's come back and reconnect. And you do that in a safe way, not a threatening Absol- way. No, not like, at all. No, yeah. so no, absolutely not. We set up the rules of enjoyment rather than the rules of engagement. So we've got the rules of enjoyment. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> the rules of enjoyment, right? And they create them, right? I'll kick it off with a couple that I think are really important. Then I'll say, how do you want this to run? What do you think we're going to have to create in terms of the environment? What has to be, I love the rules of enjoyment. Like, I love the rules of enjoyment because it's not so, yeah, it's less threatening. Yeah, make it fun. Make it fun. Like, make it fun. So well, then what are yeah. we going to need to, how do we actually interact with one another so that we all win? Everyone's got to win yes. from this, right? Like even if I'm facilitating it, yes, it's my gig. You've got to win. 
So we set the scene, we set the reason to, I talk about the motive and intent, the purpose of working in this way. Why are we doing this? What do we hope to get from it? How, okay, and this is a big one. How are we going to use the data in the intel that we get from this? You know, how do we need to use it? Because there is a lot of, I think, mistrust between people. Yes. Right? Yeah. In organisations, isn't there? Yeah, people don't trust yeah. one another. People don't trust the the, the brand or the, the big corporate or whoever it might be. So right away, we're having those discussions on the front foot. Everyone is hearing it. Everyone is contributing to it. And as we say, hey, if you're stuck on answering something, have some time to think about it. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're stuck, go away. Get out of get out of here and have some time away. Think about it. Come back to me and see what you found. And if you're still stuck, then we'll, we we can go there. But I think you I think you cannot you can do this. You can answer this. You know, you yeah. need to allow people that time in a supportive way to sit with that self reflection. And there's so there's so much self reflection in this world. And, and we just we create yes. space for that. We hold space for that. Rather than quickly move, move. You know, I always say more space for life, more space for life. Let's just allow that. Like you won't see the payoff from that immediately. Like clients will say to me, and I'm, this is, you know, be very upfront. This is not a quick outcome, even though we work very efficiently and get, you know, outcomes without, we're not sitting on our hands. But it will take a little while for you to actually see the value of this work because you can't get an yeah. immediate return on self reflection. <laughs> it does. And, happen. and, <laughs> it I love that you're happen. pulling that out. No, it doesn't. And that's that that's actually creating a lot of relief for me because I've personally uh led some teams astray in the past because I get into work and I'm like, let's move quick, let's let's get past this and get onto the real work. But actually you're missing the opportunity to to your point. I, I love that word, make so, space so, for so light. Efficient yeah, efficiency. Yeah, more space for light. Efficiency and self reflection work together. They 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 yeah. they do, right? They're not mutually um, exclusive. It's just about how yeah. you use that self reflection, right, to be able to move it. But you know, the the beauty is that, like you said, there's so much running and speed and quickly move on to the next thing. We're laying quick, quick. You know, the, the, that we value that. But we're missing, like you said, that proper space to debrief and have those discussions because that's where you're going to find the opportunities, right? That that's where you'll find um, the way forward to towards growth. Um, not not keep uh, running, Dane. So, um, pardon me. We wonder, you know, why people are burnt out too, right? So that yeah. space, that space for for proper intent, um, is critical. And there's absolutely that's why I said we design it in that way where we do experiment, we play, but the self reflection piece is critical um, to the outcome. Yeah, long term. No, I I really like it. I've written these four words down that just keep striking me from this conversation. Enjoyment. I love the rules of enjoyment. Ownership, letting people own it, kind of fill into their power. The generosity is huge. And then this space concept. So when you put those four things, and there's clearly a lot more that you're doing with your program, but they're not typical leadership and management jargon. They're, that's like, they're real things that everyone kind of wants a piece of, I would imagine. Yeah, and they are. And it doesn't matter where you are, right? We want to enjoy it. You know, right. I think I heard the other day that the average person will work, if they're working full time, this is, don't quote me on this, but I think it's 81,390 hours. Yeah. 81,390, you know, there's out of a Gallup webinar. 81,390 yeah. hours that a human will work in a lifetime. Gee, it's a lot of time to be unhappy, isn't it? It is. I mean, we yeah, laugh a drain. lot. We laugh a lot in, in our work, right? And we're dealing with sometimes heavy stuff. I've done a lot of work in traumatized organizations. I write about that, right? Like my yeah. my space is not straightforward. And I do work with with traumatized people and organizations that, you know, keep traumatizing people. That's a topic for another day. So when yeah. you can find those moments of joy and laughter, I like to laugh, Dave. I don't want to, you know, life is heavy sometimes. So what when you're yeah. laughing too, what tends to happen is you're more relaxed, right? So those yes. gems tend to fall. They fall because you're just you're enjoying. You're in that, that flow of it. You trust yeah. one another. You know why you're here. You can see a purpose behind it. So you can just be in that moment. And yeah, generosity. Yeah, you know, they're great words. I need to write them down. But um, they're that, awesome. I'll send them to you. <laughs> send them to me. They're all yours. We 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 can't. You know, the world doesn't need sanitized leadership. Right, we don't yeah. need sanitized people that are, like I said, wearing the mask and keeping up the facade. We need smart people that can find smart, that are kind, 
thing because you know why? I'm going to write about this. Because it's obviously the right thing to do and it's, it's how we need to show up. But when you are kind and work in this way, you have like a kindness bank that you're investing in, right? And you're making deposits. Yeah. Yep, there's deposits in the kindness bank. And so when the time comes and you're having to have discussions with people that are going into some areas that are not always easy, because you've invested in each other into the kindness bank, it's so much easier to be able to yes. have those discussions, right? You're making a withdrawal, but you just can because you've invested in it. Yep. But when you haven't invested in it, there's nothing to draw from. Yeah. And I think that's what I've certainly seen in my career at times. Yeah, I, I, I think it's absolutely true. I saw it even this week with my team. We were dealing with some pretty heavy stuff and I had to come out and say something I was uncomfortable to say, which wasn't necessarily um, smooth or yeah. easy to hear for some yeah. people, but yeah. but I think they heard it from where it was coming from. And because we've been putting enough time in collectively, right. we're all like, well, I'm glad I know that's how Dane feels right now. And while I don't agree with this piece, I'm glad that he shared it. Now I know where he's coming from and we're going to keep working the problem. But it wasn't like, oh, cancel, cancel that guy. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 yeah. because there's some strong foundations. They know who you are. Yeah. Once again, they know your exactly. intent. They know your reason and your motive behind it. So that's why I say start there, leaders, start there by telling that story and then living it because it, then it becomes yeah. easier. I've had very few people I don't think really – rare and we do talk about some some rather big issues that have said no nah, i'm not working with you anymore go away you know because they yeah. know the experience is good for them not easy at times but valuable and uh yeah, yeah case in point that, that's you've got the kindness bank happening <laughs> it's awesome there's so much uh great stuff we could easily continue and in fact we should continue at another time and do a second episode that would be really fun ali but Thank you, uh, Dane. I, i've learned and taken so much um, from this conversation, but also just had a lot of fun, enjoyment, reality is sinking in. It's not, it shouldn't be that hard. It should be more purposeful, but also enjoyable. And I, and I really like the way that I'm hearing you do that with, with your customers and your teams. Thank you. And thanks for the opportunity too. And I'll always come back down and yeah. keep up the good work too. I enjoy the, the sharing of ideas and the new perspectives as well too. So yeah, thank you for having Absolutely. Me if any of our listeners want to find you or Kickstart, how do they uh, best reach out? Yep. So it's kickstart, K-I-I-K-S-T-A-R-T dot com dot au. And there's some really um, great resources, including free videos and that on the site and so, um, podcasts or um, blogs or, you know, unique material that you can access it, you will, but don't make it to LinkedIn because, you know, there's only, I'm spreading the love around. And then they can yeah. find me on LinkedIn. Um, I can't remember my full URL, but Ali Uren, A-L-I. U R E N, um, you'll find me through that. And uh, as you know, I put up original content most days, Monday to Friday. So please let's uh, continue the conversation. And uh, if you're interested in continuous learning uh, and some of the challenges, but opportunities and, and how to do that, then yeah, follow me there. You'll get some good oil. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I certainly do. So thanks Thank for your you, content Dane. and work and, and let's, uh, let's keep doing it. Good on you. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. Thank you for joining us. Remember that by embracing vulnerability, trusting our intuition, and approaching challenges with compassion, we not only strengthen our teams, but also pave the way for a future where collaboration thrives. If you're hungry for more insights, strategies, and research on collaboration, head over to thefutureofteamwork.com. There, you can join our mailing list to stay updated with the latest episodes and get access to exclusive content tailored to make your team thrive. Together, we can build the future of teamwork. Until next time.